to this computer. And we'll set this soon. Okay, <clears throat> so now we have the audio system working. Oh, the chat window, that's on my to-do list. The chat window, probably like click more, chat. Okay, so we got everything going. <clears throat> Let's begin with some announcements because you know we have an exam on Friday. So we need to talk about um, <clears throat> what we're doing this week and where we're going, et cetera. So first of all, the reading assignment for this week Okay, so we're gonna go up to page 333 by Friday. Okay, that's our first item. <clears throat> our next uh, announcement here, homework four. You know, the summer session is extraordinary because we go at a very fast pace. Let's talk about homework four. Okay, so homework four <clears throat> uh, was posted on Friday, July 3rd. It's due July 7th. You see how that's a four day homework cycle. And let's talk about this. Posted Friday. Okay, it's due. <clears throat> uh, we got Tuesdays, July 7th. Okay, so let's talk about the structure here of a homework assignment. <clears throat> this is our central reality here this summer. Notice uh, an assignment is posted and four days later it is due. That is completely reasonable for a summer session because remember we're going twice as fast during the summer as we would during a regular uh, semester. So during a regular semester you typically have a one week homework cycle. So for us it's about 3.5 days and we're rounding up to four. Now, we were affected by a holiday, therefore, homework number four, we got a 24 hour grace period. That means you can submit it 24 hours late. That means July 8th, Wednesday, July 8th. <clears throat> okay, that's because of the holiday. Okay, and we're going to talk about some of the topics here that are present uh, on homework four. Uh, and we want to talk about how they relate to things that we have been doing uh, recently. Okay, so another topic here, the office hours. Okay, office hours again, this week's a very special week because we have a midterm. Um, so what I have here for myself, office hours tomorrow. Okay, that's going to be 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. And then I will have more later in the week. Uh, to be, so I will make announcements later in the week. We'll have some more office hours. <clears throat> okay, so we got the office hours. Uh, yeah, so what we want to do now as we leave chapter seven, we're going into chapter eight. <clears throat> okay, as you know, this week we must move ahead with more material, chapter eight. But in doing so, we will constantly emphasize material from chapter seven, which you need for the midterm. So attending lecture this week is a good idea because uh, <clears throat> Just quite generally for the summer session, we have to really stay on top of the course. And furthermore, we will be using material from chapter seven uh, for the exam. So as you know, I have posted one sample exam. I will post another one. And what you see there, the structure of an exam, the emphasis is on chapter seven. We do use material from earlier. For example, in chapter five, we studied how to solve differential equations. We studied this intensively and um, <clears throat> how to find a general solution, particular solution, et cetera. So yeah, uh, that, that structure is illustrated in the sample exams. 
All right, so now what we'll do here, let's take a second to um, make some remarks about chapter seven. We're leaving chapter seven and talk about how this relates to homework four. Homework four, we have the culmination of all the work we did in chapter seven. <clears throat> okay, so here's the big picture and we'll talk about our terminology, uh, right? We did have some special terminology. Okay, so terminology. Okay, uh, <clears throat> we do have some special terminology and you see this on the homework uh, both the homework problems out of Taylor plus the ones that uh, I crafted for this course. Uh, the equation of motion, so EOM, okay, <clears throat> what we're doing here, uh, this is going to be a side-by-side -side comparison because these are technical terms, you do see them used on the homework and you will see them on exams as well. So the crucial thing is the equation of motion, this is a differential uh, equation. So this is, let's put this here, is a differential Okay. So the equation of motion is a differential equation <coughs> which we must solve. Okay, that's the crucial thing. So you see this on the homework and <coughs> you do see this uh, on various exams. When it says find the equation of motion, typically what we do, we use the Lagrangian we have a prescription, right? we compute some partial derivatives with respect to Q and Q dot, et cetera. Then there's a certain total time derivative. The upshot from that is the equation of motion. This is the differential equation which we have to solve. We haven't solved it yet. That's over here. So here we have the solution. The solution to the equation of motion this is our goal. This is our goal in mechanics. We want to find the evolution, the time evolution of the system. Okay, so for one degree of freedom, you would have x as a function of t, right? So you need to find some formula. This is for one degree of freedom if it's called x. Okay, if you're in a three-dimensional space, you might find the position of a particle all right, and your answer will be some sort of formula. So this would be a three de degree of freedom uh, case. There is some terminology here. You could say the position as a function of time. Okay, the position as a function of time um, the other uh, popular terms that you will see here are the trajectory. So thinking back to the physics seven sequence or the physics five sequence, if you have, uh, so suppose you throw a baseball to your friend, um, you get this nice parabolic trajectory and we know how to write the solution. We can find X as a function of T and Y as a function of T. We get this nice parabolic trajectory. And now one more term here, um, the orbit. In classical mechanics, this term is used even if you do not have a, uh, so this is very general in classical mechanics, even if you do not have a closed orbit, one speaks of the orbit. In particular, we have constants of the motion. For example, the total mechanical energy is a constant along an orbit. So this is an old term We'll try and avoid that term, but every so often it creeps in, especially in that phrase, the total mechanical energy is constant along an orbit. It's a different constant for different orbits. And again, it need not be a, a planet orbiting a sun. It could be any mechanical system. Uh, we'll, we'll have, uh, when we get to 
Hamiltonian formulation mechanics will often be using this phrase. Okay, so um, <clears throat> what we're doing here in chapter seven here, uh, we get this. Okay, so that's just, um, <clears throat> uh, we just took a second here to um, remind ourselves about some notation, some terminology, and uh, this is useful as we summarize chapter seven. So remember what we did in our last meeting. We had some fascinating discussions. Uh, the last thing we did is we looked at a Lagrangian formulation. Okay, we extended uh, the usual framework. Right? Everything we've done in chapter seven, we have a Lagrangian that's kinetic minus potential. <clears throat> at the end of chapter seven, we did talk about the formulation that allows us to describe the motion of a charged particle in a prescribed electromagnetic field. We did this in a formulation where we wrote down a Lagrangian as kinetic minus a very special potential, so-called velocity dependent potential. But the overarching principle again is you had a Lagrangian, um, <clears throat> you write down the Euler-Lagrange equations. So once you have this, you go to the Euler-Lagrange equations. And this is a prescription where, whereby you compute some partial derivatives of this Lagrangian, and, and then you compute a certain total time derivative, and uh, then you get the, or these, these are equations of motion. Remember, these are differential equations. You haven't solved them yet. There's a whole other installment of work to be done. And again, that's why we focus on chapter five. We honed our skills in solving differential equations. We had a detailed look at how you solve differential equations. <clears throat> Okay, so um, this is an overview of what we were doing at the end of uh, chapter seven. And this is relevant here. The reason I mentioned this, homework four. Homework four is a delightful collection of problems here where we reach the culmination of chapter seven. And <clears throat> part of what we're gonna do is uh, utilize our skills. Utilize our skills. We've been very intensely studying things like power series expansions. So um, we'll make a few remarks here. Let's make some remarks on homework four and appreciate how this assignment is a, a wonderful way to exercise our knowledge of chapter seven. <clears throat> okay, so again, the bead on the spinning wire hoop. Okay, I'm curious how the battery's doing here. Uh, oh boy. Yeah, what happened is last semester in the spring semester, we had a power outage. They were able to restore power in about 20 minutes. So it's gonna be a nail biter here. Uh, my battery on myself, remember all of this hinges on batteries now because uh, the laptop's running on battery, the iPad Pro is our document, that's on battery, my cell phone, which is providing internet to this whole uh, deal here. Yeah, we're on battery and uh, the weak link right now is my cell phone battery. All right, watching it closely. Okay, so if I vanish for some reason, you know, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get this whole thing resolved. Um, <clears throat> let's talk about this. Uh, this is a wonderful example. This is very relevant uh, to the current homework assignment. For the homework assignment, you have a very similar structure. It's a, a piece of wire. You should think of fairly stiff wire <clears throat> shaped into a parabola and uh, spinning about a vertical axis and you have a bead sliding on the wire. Okay, so we've discussed this bead on the sliding hoop, uh, uh, sorry, spinning hoop, bead on spinning hoop quite a bit. And let's go strolling down memory lane here for a second as we recall what a fascinating problem it, it was. Mm -hmm. Where did, okay, there, I just saw it. Okay. So what I'll do here, you know, July 1st, we talked about this. This, uh, <clears throat> as you know, we should avoid any sort of PowerPoint overload. But what I will do, since we talked about this stuff quite a bit on July 1st, 
Remember, this was July 1st, we talked about this problem. Remember the basic setup, you have a circular hoop of wire. It's being forced to rotate about a vertical axis. <clears throat> the angular velocity is omega, the usual notion of the right hand rule, right here's the z-axis, etc. cetera. Uh, we have a very clear picture. An external agent, a motor, is forcing this hoop to rotate <clears throat> at a constant angular velocity about the z-axis. And we're interested in the motion of this particle. There is a single generalized coordinate, this theta, which can be positive or negative. So what you're doing on the homework assignment is a very similar analysis. Um, and I think what we're going to do here is actually sketch a parabola. So in pencil, I'll sketch the parabola. And you can even think of having the parabola, you know, an important concept here is a so-called radius of curvature. Anytime you have a curve, you can look at the local behavior and um, describe the curvature using a radius. So for a circular arc like this, obviously the radius of curvature is capital R. Let's draw a parabola. You see in pencil, I'm drawing a parabola now. This is for the homework problem. Okay, so here's this parabola. Which I drew in pencil. <clears throat> and you can see uh, much of the structure of the problem is the same. So you choose a generalized coordinate. There's some fascinating behavior, which we'll talk about. Um, but in terms of the physics, right, let's talk about the physics for a second. Um, you should, as you work on this homework problem with the parabola, which I drew in pencil, you should constantly refer to example 7.6 and example 7.7. .7. And let's talk about how um, <clears throat> those examples are very illuminating uh, for this homework problem and uh, how they illustrate the skills that we need. So for the bead on the spinning wire hoop, okay, um, <clears throat> we write down the Lagrangian. Right, let's just write that down here. We have that coordinate theta and the Lagrangian Okay, there is some freedom. Notice there's an additive constant. You can always add a constant to Lagrangian. That is a remark we inherit immediately from the uh, same remark for the potential. Right? So here we do have a one, which you can get rid of if you don't like it. So we had our Lagrangian. Of course, we have the prescription. And now as we go through this, let's remind ourselves the big picture. We have a Lagrangian, as you know, it's crucial that you compute the kinetic energy in an inertial frame, so your laboratory frame. Uh, right now we're assuming our laboratory frame is inertial. At the end of this week, we'll start talking about laboratories that are not inertial. That's in chapter nine. When we get to chapter nine, we'll do some very interesting stuff. Okay, so we write down the Lagrangian. Then there's a prescription. In this case, our generalized coordinate is theta. So. There's a prescription here, the Euler-Lagrange equation, in this case, tells us to compute a partial derivative like so and like so. And then after you compute this partial derivative, now you reinterpret any occurrence of theta as a function theta of t. So this is functional composition. You insert a function theta of t anywhere you see a theta. Anywhere you see a theta dot, you see uh, you insert theta dot as a function of time. The resulting object is a function of t only, Therefore, the correct notation for the derivative is ddt, okay, with a minus sign, and you've got yourself a zero here. So this is the equation of motion. Some effort is required, but we have a very clear prescription for how to set this up. So on the midterm, you will certainly be demonstrating your ability first to find the Lagrangian, being fully cognizant of the notion of generalized coordinates, then compute the partial derivatives, then compute the total time derivative, 
to get an equation in motion. Remember the equation in motion is a differential equation. We haven't really solved the physics problem yet because our goal is to find the time evolution of a system. That's what we have over here. It's, there's a whole nother round of work to be done to solve the problem for the position as a function of time in a one dimensional space, maybe three, et cetera. So that's here. Okay, so for the bead and uh, the spinning wire hoop, um, <clears throat> as we go through this, remember we got an equation of motion That omega is a constant. Okay, so again, this is our equation of motion. I want to really emphasize that it's the equation of motion. That, that term is a little bit confusing. We haven't solved for the motion as a function of time yet. This is the differential equation which governs the motion. Okay, so now there is some interesting discussion. If you look at examples 7.6, and example 7.7, .7. once you have a differential equation, there's a whole world of interesting behavior which can emerge, <clears throat> okay? And so it turns out for low frequencies, uh, we have a stable equilibrium near the bottom, right? Obviously a special case is when omega is zero, then you have a, a motionless circular hoop, a bead is sliding on the motionless, that's precisely what we call a pendulum. So if, um, if you set omega equal to zero, this is the uh, <clears throat> equation, the differential equation. It's a nonlinear differential equation, but in the very first days of our course, we talked about how you can solve for the period as a function of amplitude, et cetera. <clears throat> okay, so um, there, furthermore, in all of these remarks now belong to this portion of the discussion. Once you have the, amazing, the, the equation of motion, uh, you investigate and learn about the behavior of the system. So it turns out for this system, as you increase the uh, omega, the angular velocity, above a, th a certain threshold, um, and this uh, invokes images of wonderful classical engineering. Think of railroad technology where they would regulate, uh, they would build these mechanical devices. Uh, when you have a certain angular velocity, these two rotating arms swing up and they can actually uh, trigger uh, some sort of mechanism which will reduce the steam pressure, right? We all love steam locomotives. So, yep, <clears throat> what's happening here is uh, when you reach a certain um, special, if you set omega above a certain threshold, then, um, <clears throat> you know what, I just remember there's a situation over here. Uh, I better... Uh, I mentioned we have several devices. There's actually a fourth device which is on battery power, but the battery is so old that it doesn't have a good low end that it can suddenly go to a catastrophic low value. And that results in a non-graceful shutdown of the computer, which you don't want. Um, <clears throat> so I had to suspend that one. All right, but we're still going strong here with our document camera and our laptop. And actually I'm curious about the battery over here. Yep, looks pretty good. Okay, so yeah, the behavior, and again, you're going to investigate this uh, homework four, very similar story. Um, the behavior, the fascinating behavior that you have uh, different regions, and we'll see this as a theme throughout the course. When you solve differential equations, the, uh, there are different regions which, which exhibit different behavior. And later in the course, we'll talk about a so-called separatrix. There is uh, typically a boundary between different regions that exhibit different behavior. Uh, so we're seeing that here as omega, uh, if you exceed a certain threshold, then there are fundamentally new equilibria which uh, come into existence. And there's a foundation skill, which is to do an expansion, okay? So there, if you have one of these, oops, one of these equilibria, trying to draw, that's a theta naught plus little epsilon. So this is the equation as you see it in the book. Let's uh, include some more information because often this notation is very streamlined. Okay, we have a, a question in the chat window. Okay, now I must say, in, we're running Windows now. Okay, here we go. 
I was, I was about to start complaining because it doesn't tell me the time of day when the message was sent. But if you move the mouse in and then it tells you the time of day, it was sent one minute ago. The sine squared theta. Yep. Um, what's happening here is we constructed uh, the kinetic energy, right? And so let's remind ourselves, <clears throat> again, I'll, I'll invoke, um, these are some notes on July 1st when we talked about this. It's possible to identify two components to the velocity. Okay, this component is tangential to the hoop, and here we invoke our notion of radians. Theta is measured in radians, so theta dot is an angular velocity. This is the component of the velocity tangential to the hoop, and then there's a component normal to the hoop. You could also say perpendicular. Okay. Perpendicular is a little better because normal, that word is overused. When we, when we normalize a vector, we make its length equal to one, okay? So, um, and when we speak of the norm of a vector, that's the length of the vector. So perhaps for extra clarity, this word perpendicular. So there's a component here, perpendicular to the plane of the paper. For safety, I'll remove the cap from the pen and go like so, perpendicular, uh, wow. Fantastic resolution here on this camera. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> and the crucial thing is your distance from the axis, it's indicated in the diagram here, this row is uh, your, the usual cylindrical row, r times sine theta. And since we're scaring, we get this sine squared. So that's, yep, yeah, great. So great question. And um, again, that was a question in the chat window sent uh, privately, <clears throat> you're welcome to ask questions privately or publicly. Um, so um, a foundation skill that we're gonna use here is <clears throat> we identify, right, it's the existence of a new equilibrium. Very exciting for large omega, we do have the existence of new equilibrium. Let theta naught denote such an equilibrium. And what we wanna do is let's talk about this formula in more detail. Okay, so as usual in this upper formula, this is the way it's typeset in the book. It's a rather sparse notation, right? Uh, we have suppressed the argument. So written in more detail, theta is a function of time. This theta naught is a constant. And this epsilon is a function of time. So <laughs> this is a statement that we're going to investigate the motion of the system, especially, and we're especially interested in the structure when this epsilon is small. We can say that because epsilon is a dimensionless quantity. So it's meaningful to say small, much less than one, one radian, right? Okay. And then um, we'll do the usual uh, power series expansion. We're keeping terms to first order and epsilon. And in doing this, you can extract the behavior. <clears throat> what we see is that the second time derivative is a constant so that constant turns out to be in the language of the text, uh, it's a capital omega prime. I'm going to emphasize here, it's simply a constant, okay? It's a positive constant. So here's a minus sign, then you have this positive constant and here's an epsilon, okay? Once you reach this point, again, this is an equation of motion. It's a differential equ equation, which we must solve, but the structure is precisely what we investigated in chapter five. So in chapter five, we set the foundation for these kind of equations. We know what to do both in the case of a positive and a negative constant. For a negative a constant such as this, we have oscillatory behavior. And this is precisely why these equilibria are called stable equilibria. A small excursion away from the equilibrium results in oscillatory behavior. If this were a positive constant, then a small displacement away from the equilibrium would grow exponentially. We would have cinches and cautious, hyperbolic sines and cosines. <clears throat> okay, so um, yep. So those are some remarks on what we're doing here in homework four. Again, the extraordinarily fast pace of this course. Um, and again, I'll have office hours tomorrow to talk about this homework or anything else that you like. Okay, so now we're going to be moving on. Uh, so here's what we're going to do.
Um, the material on the Lagrange multiplier is fascinating stuff, but our, uh, our schedule here does not permit us to really delve into this. So we're going to go on into chapter eight. And as we go into chapter eight, remember, this is wonderful, uh, wonderful material uh, for anyone interested in reviewing chapter seven. We're gonna make heavy use of our understanding of chapter seven. <clears throat> okay, so um, as we go through this, I want to take uh, some time to emphasize a special Berkeley's perspective because our friends in the math department, many of these are historical figures in the world of mathematics. So let me write it like this. Chapter eight. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the mathematicians right, right across the street from the uh, physics building, we have Evans Hall with lots of mathematicians. Uh, I remember during my PhD work back in the 90s, um, <clears throat> we would often meet with mathematicians because many of them did study mechanics <clears throat> and they're interested in formulating mechanics in very special ways using geometry. Um, it's the so-called theory of reduction, okay? So let me write this here, theory Okay, um, <clears throat> what we're doing is if, if a system has some symmetry, we're gonna reduce uh, <clears throat> the number of degrees of freedom. That is to say, if a system has some symmetry, how can we simplify the problem and eventually solve it? Okay, so what I will do here, let's make a very dramatic statement here. <clears throat> We're going to talk about uh, a progression. We're gonna start with a problem that has six degrees of freedom, okay? And this is the problem of two particles moving under the influence of a force, um, with, uh, an interactive force, which we'll, we'll, we'll describe this as a central force. So it's going to be amazing here. As we go through this, we start with a six degree of freedom problem. We will use symmetries and we'll use our notion, uh, our knowledge of Lagrangian mechanics to go to a three degree of freedom problem. Then we'll go to a two degree of freedom problem. And then you guessed it, a one degree of freedom. So this is an amazing accomplishment, right? We, um, we start with a very difficult problem. You know, a six degree of freedom problem is in general very difficult. Um, we've seen how we know how to solve one degree of freedom problems. Sometimes, sometimes we can solve two degree of freedom problems, but sometimes they're too difficult. So this is a remarkable achievement here in chapter eight. We start with a six degree of freedom problem. We use uh, knowledge of symmetries to simplify and the remaining problem then is this three degree of freedom problem. And then we use some more knowledge of symmetries to go to two degrees of freedom and finally one degree of freedom. And we know we can solve a one degree of freedom problem as we did at the beginning of our summer session, we can find uh, an integral. We can basically reduce the entire problem to solving a certain integral. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about how we do this. And um, the basic, uh, so you know, I like to emphasize that the mathematicians over in Evans Hall uh, Alan Weinstein, obviously he's one of the pioneers, and Jerry Marsden, um, really you know, famous mathematicians, did really remarkable things. And they were the leaders here in this theory of reduction uh, in recent decades. Okay, so what we're doing here relates to the amazing things there in the theory of reduction. <clears throat> All right, so now central forces Okay, so we're gonna be talking about central forces. Um, yeah, it's starting to get hot, hot in here. Unfortunately, I can't turn on a fan because there's no 
electric power here. None of my neighbors can turn on their fans either. So we routinely have 100 degree weather out here. So, <clears throat> okay, let's draw a picture here. The, the, the fundamental setup is uh, captured with, by this diagram. We like to draw these three axes here. We've got an X axis, a Y axis, and a Z axis, <clears throat> like so. Um, and I find it useful to use a different color here because I'm gonna draw some more arrows. It could be overwhelming. It would look just like a bunch of arrows. Uh, so if we use a different color, then we can have this distinction. <clears throat> All right, these three arrows are the familiar Cartesian axis, axes. All right, and we're gonna talk about two particles. So using very important notation to us, right? Remember equation 734, which was one of the foundation equations in chapter seven. We like to um, <clears throat> identify the particle with this kind of notation, right? Remember the general, I'll write it over here. Our general notation was this, the alpha was the particle index. So now in this problem, we're gonna have two particles, so we do need to incorporate this particle index. So alpha particle. So what we're doing here is a wonderful opportunity to remind ourselves of equation 734. Remember I emphasize how important equation 734 was. Okay, here's particle number two. Let's just say it's over here somewhere. So you see why I'm using a different color. This would look like some crazy five axis thing. Okay, we have two particles, particle number one, particle number two. Obviously they're distinguishable because we're doing classical physics. And now the relative position vector. This is exciting. If you like vector subtraction, this is the moment you've been waiting for. We're gonna do a vector subtraction like this. <clears throat> okay, our definition here throughout chapter eight, we have a dedicated role. This lowercase r vector is a vector difference. So we use this triple equal sign here to indicate this is the definition. That's a symbol that's often used to indicate you have a definition. <clears throat> okay, it's a vector subtraction. Um, notice if you add the r2 over to the other side, now you have a, a, an addition. r1 is the r vector plus r2, and that's the head to tail construction here. So in the black ink, I have the R vector. And this is the familiar head to tail construction for a vector addition. There's the R2 vector plus the R vector giving you R1. Okay, this is gonna be crucial. So this is the relative displacement, right? So R, you can think of R as standing for relative, um, but really it's part of a bigger picture. We like to use the R vector for positions in a three dimensional space. So this is the relative displacement. Okay, so um, <clears throat> there's our relative displacement. So the crucial thing now is to appreciate this, uh, this portion of the diagram. This is a six degree of freedom problem. What I'm going to do is encircle the diagram. I think for, for best clarity, I will encircle it like this, a funny shaped circle, but it goes like so. Six degrees of freedom. What are the six degrees of freedom? They're x1, x2, y1, y2, z1, z2. Okay, so you have six, you could use others and we will use others, but this is a perfectly good choice of six generalized coordinates. x1, y1, z1, x2, y, six degrees of freedom. Okay, and certainly uh, you can write down Lagrange and we'll be doing that in just a moment. <clears throat> um, uh, when we get to the three degrees of freedom, we will identify the variables here, et cetera, and so forth. And ultimately, we'll get to a one degree of freedom problem. Okay. Now we're going to assume that we have a central force, and that means it's parallel. So the central force
What does that mean? It's parallel to R, to this interparticle. Think of the Newtonian gravitational force, parallel to R. If you look at more advanced theories of gravity, it's not going to be parallel to R because there could be gravitational waves, right? If you have one particle and you move it, it's going to produce some gravitational waves. The gravitational force experienced by the other particle, obviously it need not point directly at the first particle. But for classical Newtonian gravity, this is a correct statement. <clears throat> Ditto for electrostatic forces. It's going to get more complicated if you move the electric charges and Again, you'll have electromagnetic radiation, uh, but there are very, very many problems where we are interested in this notion of a central force and especially Newtonian gravity, right? We're gonna have a lot of fun computing the orbits of satellites. We'll have a look at the spacecraft Cassini, okay? The spacecraft Cassini, um, I have some de detailed data we can look at from the folks at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL, down in Pasadena. And we can watch Cassini uh, pass by the planet Venus. This was done intentionally to increase the kinetic energy of the spacecraft relative to the solar system barycentric, the so-called J2000 solar system barycentric coordinates. Okay. And there were actually two flybys. When, when the term that's used is flyby. Of course, sp spacecraft's not flying. It's actually falling the whole time. Um, <clears throat> okay. So um, that's where we're going. There's going to be a hierarchy. Now, when we get to, um, we'll, we'll extract the center of mass motion to get three degrees of freedom. Then, when we get to two degrees of freedom, we will have a picture that can really identify um, the orbit. So I'll draw a picture like this. Okay, this is kind of an overview. Um, when we get to two, but we'll want to have a look at some of the fascinating results that we're going to get to. And some of these results come as a surprise to many people. So here's what we're going to do. Okay, I'm going to draw a picture here. Uh, <clears throat> so again, there's a hierarchy here. When we do the three degree of freedom problem, um, we're going to have this relative right displacement. So this portion here will have these coordinates. Uh, X, Y, and Z, just I'll put them like this. Okay. And the picture that goes with that is there will be a space you now where you have a single particle. I think I'm going to have to do a small diagram here like so. X, Y, Z. We're going to have a single particle of mass mu, the so-called reduced mass. Let me draw this picture, I guess, in keeping with that, I'm going to draw R like so. Voila. I want to, I know if I make the line thicker, then the red color really, look at that, the red color is so much better if you make it thicker. Okay. So what's happening here is the original problem, we had two particles, they had their own identity. Particle number one had mass M1. I can squeeze it in here. And particle number two had mass M2. We're going to show how to uh, use our knowledge of symmetry to study the motion of a single particle. The position is this R vector, and the mass of the particle is mu, the so-called reduced mass, the product over the sum, m1, m2, over the sum, m1 plus m2. Okay, so this picture here, I'm going to, just like a soap bubble, I'm going to attach it there. This equation for the relative displacement, and this picture showing you a single particle of mass mu moving in a three-dimensional space, that's here at three degrees of freedom. Now let's talk about two degrees of freedom. We're going to show that this motion is always perpendicular to the angular momentum vector. And so we're going to have two nu. For emphasis, I'm going to call this x nu and y nu. Oops. OK. And now here comes uh, uh, the first amazing result. Well, suppose you have an elliptical orbit. I'll be very careful. Okay, it turns out in Taylor's book, and especially if you look at the chapter eight summary, <clears throat> we choose 
to position the ellipse like so. So if you use the usual coordinates, you have an angle phi, right? The plane polar coordinates, and you have this R, okay? And we'll have a very nice simple formula. This gives you the position, right? We'll be able to write down a simple formula for the shape of this orbit. It turns out it's extraordinarily complicated to, um, so I'll put it like so, right? And here we're going to emphasize something we've been talking about all, all along throughout this course is there is a functional relationship R as a function of theta, of phi, I'm sorry, the angle here for plane polar coordinates, the angle is phi. There's a relationship between R and phi, and this is in the chapter uh, eight summary. So this is in the, this result, which I've shown here for the case of an elliptical orbit. This is in the chapter eight summary. Okay. However, to solve for r as a function of t and phi as a function of t, those are transcendental equations. So we'll have some discussion in lecture. It's not covered in our textbook, but we'll talk about how you would solve this. And these are transcendental. Okay. So we'll have some discussion of these transcendental equations. Now here's another surprising thing. Um, we have this nice, this is a so-called Kepler ellipse, right? We have an elliptical orbit. The conventions we use for this course is that uh, the center of the ellipse is actually to the left of the origin. It's a little annoying, but that's just the way it works out. So the closest approach, the so-called perihelion is here. And then the furthest approach is over here. Okay, if you look at the same motion and velocity space, and let's draw the picture uh, down here below this one. So in velocity space, okay, we'll have two axes, the Vx and the Vy. Okay, and let's suppose it's going counterclockwise. Well, you know, at the closest approach, um, <clears throat> you have the greatest speed, right? The kinetic energy is the largest here for a gravitational problem. Okay, so we have the greatest speed. So the velocity vector points up and it's large. In this picture, we'll draw a dot here. So when you're at the perihelion, when you're closest to the uh, center, to the force center, you have the greatest velocity. It turns out this is a circle. It's a circle and it is not centered at the origin. And I'm trying hard to make a good circle. We're going to talk about the uh, eccentricity of the ellipse. So this is an ellipse. This is a so-called Kepler ellipse. <clears throat> this one is a circle. <clears throat> and I will claim most people don't know that the path in velocity space is a circle. OK. For a Kepler ellipse, <clears throat> we're going to prove this. <clears throat> For a Kepler ellipse, which looks like so, now for this, for low eccentricity, they actually do ra look rather circular. I could, I could draw a more extreme Kepler ellipse, like let's use a different color. All right, not too bad. <clears throat> so there's a, a, an ellipse with a higher eccentricity. So these are ellipses, but the path in velocity of space is always a circle. So that's a remarkable result that we're going to uh, get to here in, in this chapter. <clears throat> Okay, quick battery check. Uh, we do have a critical battery. Okay, oh boy. Yeah, uh, so what happens if, if the battery on that mobile phone dies, um, then, uh, and there's no electrical power from the PG&E company, then we'll have to postpone the rest of the lecture for later today. But I'm gonna keep lecturing until that battery uh, dies. And I can tell when it dies because this document camera uh, is communicating with my laptop via the internet. So when the cell phone battery expires and that will uh, cease to work. <clears throat> okay, so we're, what we've done here is we've set up um, some of the framework. So this stuff here is the two degree of freedom problem. And let's put a nice blob here.
Yeah, two degree of freedom problem. You see the two axes, the x nu, and why, why did we have to introduce x nu and y nu? It's because in this picture here, this was a three degree of freedom problem. You have a particle of mass mu, the reduced mass, moving in a three dimensional space. We're gonna show that the angular momentum is conserved, but the angular momentum could point in an arbitrary direction. So the constancy of the angular momentum uh, tells us then that the position vector shown in red here must be perpendicular to the angular momentum because of the cross product. And so the motion is confined to a two dimensional space, which is perpendicular to the angular momentum. Right? So it's important to note that this two dimensional space depends on the initial conditions. Remember, when you prepare the system, and the system was this original collection of two particles, you chose the initial conditions, the initial positions, and the initial velocities. 12 numbers, right? Six degrees of freedom. You choose 12 numbers as the initial conditions here. <clears throat> One of the consequences is you choose the angular momentum vector for this picture, and um, the motion is perpendicular to the plane defined by the angular momentum vector. Okay, we'll have a separate discussion for zero angular momentum. Um, that's always fun. But the point is, these two axes here, the reason I call them x nu and y nu, is they should not be confused with the x and y axis in this picture. These are coordinates now in the plane that's perpendicular to the angular momentum vector. <clears throat> okay. And then we'll show for the case of gravity, right, this, this discussion is not restricted to gravity. There are other central forces, for example, Hooke's law force. The funny thing is, again, those, the solution for Hooke's law force, again, you get ellipses, but the, the ellipses in that case are centered at the origin. These ellipses are not centered at the origin. <clears throat> okay, so um, let's talk about how we can use this notion of a central force, right? A central force, you have a force uh, as a function of this R vector. It's equal to some scalar, which we'll call lowercase f of R times R hat. All right, so this force is measured in Newtons. The notation indicates it's a function of R. And we're assuming a central force. So as you know, this R hat is a dimensionless unit vector. The length of that vector is one. So again, the lowercase f has dimensions of Newtons and it's the magnitude of the force. <clears throat> okay, so we're gonna assume that this is conservative. So this f is minus a gradient of some function u, then there's a calculation you can do, right? We have a nice formula for the gradient in spherical coordinates. Basically, you write down that formula. Uh, so use the gradient formula in spherical coordinates. Okay, and then <laughs> the assumption that this force vector is in the R direction means that the other components, the theta hat and the phi hat components are zero, okay? Then you can conclude that those partial derivatives, right? The partial derivative of U with respect to theta must vanish and the partial derivative of U with respect to phi must vanish. So this function U is a function only of R. This is the length of the R vector. Let's emphasize that here. Sometimes we want to really emphasize that that little R is the length of the R vector. So there's our notation. Of course, when we write things by hand, we put the arrows, that's the R vector. When it's typeset in the book, then you have the boldface R and there are no over vectors like that. The two vertical bars indicate the length of the vector. So what we've shown here with this calculation, computing the gradient and spherical coordinates is that the potential energy must be a function of R. This is very important to us. If we go back to um, our discussion up here, the potential energy, and let's include it here, we've just shown that the potential energy must be a function. Here's a vertical bar, R1 minus R2. Okay, so for central forces, we've shown that the potential energy in principle, it could have been a function of these six variables. That would be a disaster. In fact, it is a function only of the inner particle separation. 
Right, again, the two vertical bars indicate the length of that vector, and that's a vector difference. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to be studying problems where the potential energy is only a function of the inner particle separation. Okay, so now uh, here's where we get to use chapter seven. Remember, I've been advocating this uh, discussion of chapter eight as a wonderful opportunity to prepare for the midterm exam, which only covers up to chapter seven. We're gonna use our skills now from chapter seven. And here we go. We know that one of the fundamental things about the Lagrangian formulation of mechanics is that you can change coordinates. So we have a choice here of six generalized coordinates. What if we choose six different generalized coordinates? Well, we know what to do. We can transform the Lagrangian. So this is a crucial thing uh, that you need for the exam. <clears throat> the ability to transform a Lagrangian from one choice of coordinates to another. Okay, so here we go. All right, so for the six degree of freedom problem, let's line it up like so. Six degrees of freedom. We're going to use our knowledge from chapter seven. We're gonna change coordinates. <clears throat> okay, so here we go change coordinates. There will be six old coordinates and six new coordinates. This is precisely the stuff we love doing in classical Lagrangian mechanics. Okay, so the old coordinates, <clears throat> we got x1, y1, z1, x2, y2, z2. Okay, and there's some really cool, if you enjoy algebra, there's some really cool algebra we're gonna do here. So uh, the important thing to us right now is to observe that we have six uh, generalized coordinates. In this case, we chose the Cartesian coordinates <clears throat> of the two particles. Okay, the new coordinates, all right, uh, let's, let's express this in a couple different ways. So these six coordinates here, Here we've, we've listed them as a list of six coordinates. We have alternative notation, right? You could just simply say the R1 vector and the R2 vector. So this is fully equivalent. Again, there are six coordinates here, three right there and three more there. Okay, so the new coordinates are gonna be defined as follows. Uh, we have R, that relative displacement vector, which we just talked about, right? It was the R1 minus R2. And we're gonna define capital R to be the center of mass position, okay? But the structure is what's important to us here. So you know you obtain the center of mass by computing a mass weighted sum. So it'll be M1 R1 plus M2 R2 <clears throat> over the total mass. Okay, so it's important to appreciate that these six numbers here, these are the new coordinates. Okay. And we could write them out. For example, you could write x is equal to x1 minus x2, y is equal to y1 minus y2, etc. Same for z. <clears throat> okay. And here you could write the capital X, right? Capital X. Capital X is the first component of this vector. And you see what it is, right? It's M1 times the first, that's X1, plus M2, X2 over the total mass. Okay, but what's really important to us is to understand this entire discussion here, everything we're doing is an example of changing the coordinates, right? This is the important concept. It's one of our foundation concepts from chapter seven. If you have a problem, you can write down the Lagrangian in one coordinate. Perhaps you're looking at a pendulum and you've chosen an angle, wonderful. But you could also transform that Lagrangian into a different cho choice of coordinate. So if you're looking at a pendulum and you choose a different coordinate, such as the distance from the pendulum bob over to some distant wall, that's a perfectly good coordinate. 
So the notion of changing the coordinates is crucial to us. And then we transform the Lagrangian. That means you express the kinetic energy in these new coordinates. And here's what happens. So the Lagrangian Okay, this is the Lagrangian in the old coordinates. And notice the structure. <clears throat> we have these six coordinates. Where are they? Well, they're in here. Remember R, right? Let's just really emphasize what's going on here. Again, we want to cement our understanding of chapter seven. This R is the square root of X1 minus X2 squared plus y1 minus y2 squared plus z1 minus z2 squared. Okay, so the six coordinates that you see here are inside of this r, because r is this nice square root. So all six coordinates do occur there. And then they, they you know, we speak of q's and q dots. q is our notion, it's, that's our notation for a generalized coordinate. So um, the q's occur here. And then the q dots occur here very nicely. Uh, obviously, r1 dot, that's, you've got an x1 dot, a y1 dot, and a z1 dot. And when we square a vector, that means we form the dot product with itself. So it's funny that there are two different dots, right? We have the dot for time derivative, and we have the dot for dot product. Completely different things, right? The dot for time derivative, that's just notation that physicists like to use. It's, it's a time saver, right? If you want to indicate time differentiation, uh, total time derivative and you use the dot. <clears throat> okay, so I just want to put that out there as just kind of a general remark. We want to be aware of these remarkable uh, idiosyncrasies in our notation, the use of the dot for time derivative and the use of the dot for the dot product. Both of them occur here because this R1 dot is the velocity vector for particle number one, time derivative. The square here there's no explicit reference to the dot product. That's an operation between vectors. But it's understood that if you square a vector, that means you multiply it times itself. The only sensible operation is the dot product. You wouldn't do a cross product. If you do a cross product of a vector with itself, it's going to be zero. So yeah, this has to be the dot product. OK. Yep. So there's the Lagrangian in the old coordinates. <clears throat> now, you simply have a, uh, some algebra to do. We're going to express the Lagrangian in terms of the new coordinates. Okay, so there's some algebra. We'll skip the algebra here in lecture, but let's just go right to the answer because it's really cool how this works out. The Lagrangian in the new coordinates, we have capital M, and let's just record over here, capital M is just the total mass, M1 plus M2. Okay, and the capital R dot, that's the velocity of the center of mass. So you would say this is the kinetic energy of the center of mass. And now the other terms we'll put in parentheses, there's something really cool that occurs here. Plus one half, uh, the reduced mass, which we defined earlier, it's M1, M2 over the sum, capital M. And then we have our lowercase r, remember the relative displacement vector, squared minus U of r. <clears throat> Okay, so there's a wonderful structure that has emerged here. Uh, in our notation, it's made very clear by the fact that we have capital letters here, okay, and lowercase letters here. So we have the separation of Lagrangian is now a sum of two terms. Anytime you have a Lagrangian that's the sum of two terms, uh, some wonderful things happen, okay? And we can understand how wonderful those things are when we start computing partial derivatives. But let's just observe this thing here, uh, we're going to call this the Lagrangian for the center of mass. Cm is for center of mass. Okay. And this thing here, we're going to call this the Lagrangian for the relative motion. Okay. And the structure, again, which has emerged is remarkable. The center of mass Lagrangian 
depends only on these three. Remember, we have three coordinates here. We have, we have a total of six generalized coordinates, but they're organized into capital and lowercase. The three here, capital X, capital Y, capital Z, the only occurrence is here in this Lagrangian. And the lowercase variables, they occur over here. So if you have this separation, the crucial thing is there's a plus sign here. This would not work if it was a product. Um, actually, maybe I should qualify that. I have to think about it. It might work. You have to think about the partial derivatives we're going to compute. There could be a cancellation. Uh, you actually think it would fail when you compute the total time derivative. But that's a, a tangential remark. Let's just observe if you have the sum like so, then when you start computing partial derivatives, suppose you compute the partial derivatives with respect to capital letters, all these terms are zero because there are no capital letters here. So you get equations of motion, right? The crucial terminology that we talked about earlier today. So this center of mass uh, Lagrangian gives you equation of motion for the center of mass. And this relative Lagrangian, we can make the same remarks. When you take this relative Lagrangian and you start computing the partial derivatives, right? We have six generalized coordinates. You must compute partial derivatives. Um, when you compute partial derivatives with respect to the lowercase variables, um, the resulting differential equations, again, involve only the lowercase variables. There's no reference to the capital. So this Lagrangian gives us equations of motion for the relative motion. So it is this observation here which gives us the first step in this diagram. This was a diagram from earlier today. So the step going from six degrees of freedom to three degrees of freedom, I'm now shading it more heavily. <clears throat> and the reason is um, we have just accomplished this step. We did it with this wonderful change of coordinates. It was a divine insight that you use the relative position vector and the center of mass vector, <clears throat> right? These are the six new coordinates. You transform the Lagrangian to the six new coordinates. Again, these are foundation skills from chapter seven. Would be good to know on Friday. And in this case, we are rewarded. We have a Lagrangian that is manifestly the sum of two terms. That is, you can separate the terms into two groups as we have done with these boxes. And you have occurrences of the capital uh, variables exclusively here and the lowercase variables exclusively here. So the Lagrangian is manifestly written as the sum of two Lagrangians. And that means the equations of motion, they decouple, right? So the crucial thing here is that these equations of motion, they decouple that means, that's a technical term saying there's no reference here for, to the lowercase variables. All of these equations of motion simply make statements about the capital variables. <clears throat> yep, same is true here. These equations, again, these are differential equations for the lowercase variables, and there's no reference to the capital ones. <clears throat> now this one, we've already solved this, right? This Lagrangian, it, you see the kinetic energy, the familiar structure. It's a free particle. Okay, we got a problem. Yep, yep. It's uh, game over here. <clears throat>